listening from Goa. Welcome to the second day of the webinar on the periodical press culture of Goa, held to commemorate the bicentenary of the Gazette of the Goa from 1821 to 2021. This is organized by the International Group of Studies of the Colonial Periodical Press of the Portuguese Empire Goa chapter in collaboration with the Center for Humanities and the Center for Research in Anthropology and Circle of Studies in South Asia, all in Portugal. Today we have four speakers, Dr. Adelaide Vieira Machado, Dr. Sharmila Paish, Dr. Frederick Narona, Dr. Sibeli Aldrovandi. A few tips to our participants. We request our participants to switch off both their audio and video. At the end of the four speakers, participants are requested to write their questions in the chat box. And the speakers are requested to go through these questions in the order of their talk in order to reply to these questions. I begin with our first speaker, Dr. Adelaide Vieira Machado. She has a doctorate in history and her thesis was on the importance of being Portuguese, José Liberato Freire de Carvalho, editor of the Investigador Português in England. This thesis has been converted into a book. She is affiliated to the Universidad São Paulo and the Fundação de Amparo a Pesquisa de São Paulo. She is also a postdoctoral researcher of the University of São Paulo, Faculty of Philosophy, Literature and Human Sciences, and she is also working on the project, The Cultural Impact of the Colonial Act of 1930 in the Portuguese Empire, a Goa Perspective. She is a researcher of CREA and a member of CS. She is the founder member of the group of the periodical press and a member of Pensado de Goa. She is a member of the project since 2000, 2016 on press and circulation of ideas, the role of newspapers of the 19th and 20th century. May I present to you Dr. Adelaide Vieira Machado. No, you, you might disconnect your, your... Thank you, Sushila. So uh, I like to salute everyone, uh, especially the, the organizers and uh, all the panel and public. So I will begin with my, my uh, communication today, which is entitled Diário das Cortes, the colonial issue in the debate of the liberal constitution of 1822. The complexity of the political and cultural relations that explain the modern world has been studied and deepened from different perspectives and by different areas of knowledge. From the dialogue between ancient imperial practice and the various types of nationalism, we are interested today in circumscribing to those empires that have been built from nation states structured around the concept of sovereignty and the reading that liberalism made of it with the various fragmentations, transfers and representations paving the way for the colonial empires by two ways simultaneously, the principle of free trade and that of territorial expansion on other continents. This complex process began on the 15th, 16th centuries with identical results at different regions for, for the regions involved, coincided in time with various types of political organization, some in decline, such as, the, such as some dynastic empires, others flourishing as cult cultural and political structures, the colonial empires, 
and the various forms of political and economic domination of globalized imperialism. The concept of empire encompasses those of colonialism and imperialism. Empires are expensive, militarized, and multinational political organizations that place limits on the political sovereignty of the governments of their periphery. In colonialism, the conquered governments or peoples were not only governed by foreign conquerors, but configured as inferior to the occupants, inferior in legal, administrative, social, and cultural terms. Imperialism, on the other hand, involves political control of foreign lands, even without the annexation of land or sovereignty. We have the, the, the examples of Britain and, and uh, even the United States. Following Frederick Cooper, we see ourselves moving beyond simply treating modern, modernity, liberalism, citizenship, or equality as if they were fixed doctrines contained in themselves, not affected by the appropriations or and reformulations given to them by the process by process of political mobilization and liberation fights on other continents or in Europe itself. The 19th century began as the previous one ended, had ended with the struggles for the independence of the American colonies against European colonial monarchies. If the Seven Years' War conducted between 1766 1756 uh, to 1763 demonstrated the existence of a globalized world in which a war that began in Europe involved all the other continents and their colonies. It also demonstrated the existence of colonial elites willing to fight and contribute to the government of the metropolis while also empower themselves as agents of change. The peace between England and the United States of America established in the Treaty of Versailles, the 1783, which culminated the Declaration of Independence of North American Colony, made in 1776, came in colonial terms to put an end to the provisions initiated in the Treaty of Paris at the end of the aforementioned Seven Years' War. More importantly, it demonstrated the possibility of independence to all colonies, as well as gave an idea of whom would be excluded of this empowerment process. As revolutions, Americans, Haitians, South Americans took place in a world configured by empires with their internal and external policies, the free Englishmen of North America declared his English rights against the English Parliament and wanted to create an empire of freedom. Indians and slaves had no place over the new government. If they opted for the Federal Republic, Napoleon, on the other side of the Atlantic, sought to build this empire by all known, known means of political organization parts incorporated into a core structure, others ruled by his relatives or by all dynasties cooperating with the regime, by indirect military authority or by systems of alliances. What underlined the modernity of this idea of empire was the attempt of political administrative centralization through the so-called Napoleon Code a kind of constitutional charter, which from the idea of equity before the law, sought to end the privileges of the society of the ancient regime. Mention, mentioning Napoleon here becomes important in two ways. First, the idea of granting a constitutional text that thus seconded the parliamentary representations. And two, the fact that this attempt of colonial expansion reached the Iberian Peninsula with the French military, military invasion, first of Spain and after of Portugal. 
and as a consequence have provoked the escape of the Portuguese court to Brazil, thus carrying the sovereignty of the metropolis to the colony. This event and the subsequent resistance to the French occupation of Spanish and Portuguese brought profound consequences to the colonial empire, colonial Portuguese empire. The Prat, a French author who lived throughout the, the revolutionary period of the late 18th century and early 19th century, was one of the pioneers of the colonial issue to which he devoted several years and works. By his work, the three last months of South America and Brazil, written in 1817, a kind of diary of the events involved in, ver in various reflections on the colonial problem, we can contextualize the world framework in which South American independences came to occupy the European publicists. According to this author, the colonial question was the one that was on the world agenda. He said, over the past 20 years, we have published several writings on colonial issues. We have been awakened, awakened to the sound of the truly immense events that have just taken place in the colonial order. Following the pattern of the dev development of the colonial elites, the Pratt argued that the natural way was the independence of the colony. He accused the European governments of not understanding the balance that globalization had struck by making the two hemispheres interdependent on the, on the defense and maintenance of mutual interests. It is no longer the idea to possess colonies, to dominate it, that from now on we can aspire, but only to regularize it. This is what is truly worth, worthy of the power and enlightenment of Europe, stated the Prat. Europe must enter the career of civilization first and must only work to bring it to all the backwards parts of the globe. This, uh, this is an idea of that go through all 19th century. The, 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 the need of Europe to civilize the others. Then to make them go through it faster than she did herself. Yes, even faster than the Europeans. But let it not bring them these benefits with a parsimonious hand that it extends to all parts of the colonial world. Only in a general order can common salvation be found. One of the reasons that led the author, this author to write and disseminate this work was to demonstrate that the independence direct direction of the colonies through the elites aware of their rights was irreversible in the short and medium term. And that the unique way for Europe not to get isolated in the process was to legitimize it through a colonial congress of all colonial powers. Constructive dialogue, it was necessary, not force, he stated. For today, everything in the world is so intertwined, so intertwined that strictly speaking, there are no more purely personal matters. An isolated affair can only be a zero or an absurdity. This misunderstand to follow the renewal of times led conservative government and supporters to identify all moving, movements in favor of change as part of the revolutionary spirit. The, liber, the liberals opposed to this, to this the example of England and Spain that illustrated well the error of wanting to force the colonies to remain under the yoke of the metropolis when they developed to the point of being able to govern themselves. The French author summarized the sufferers of South and North American colonies that had fought to defend metropolis monarchies and had proved their loyalty only to understand their own strength and aimed for autonomy and independence. The public opinion, he said, was the queen which army formed in a very slow way, but invincible when gathered because it has already all invaded the minute it shows itself. 
The American and the French revolutions were brought with them the embodiment of various theories and doctrines discussed during the 17th and 18th centuries with all enlightenment thinkers and philosophers. The ideas of nation and people that constituted of public opinion that gave them a joint identity, gave a new consistence to the literature of all liberal thinkers and publicists of the early 800s. That is the immediate, the immediate link between thought and action. This connection was the base of the concept of change in the new way of looking in, at politics as knowledge and as a method of understanding the world. Today, men know too much to consider governments only on the side of, of the satisfaction of the incumbents. They also want to find their own satisfaction of the needs of society. On the other hand, the colonies, they have become strong, rich, populated, know as much as the metropolis, are as demanding as they are, and want to be governed for them and no longer by attendants sent from another world and always ready to return. In this conflict, who will give in? Colonies or metropolis? So all this old order has crumbled. Like the French author, several Portuguese authors had in mind for the Portuguese empire a model, a model of liberal society whose elites would be evaluated not by for titles of nobility, but for the capacity, capacitary system, that is, in which each would be rewarded for the amount of individual effort he puts at the service of society, crossing academic and with economic and financial success. The dialogue with the Prat translated into several Portuguese newspapers, especially those of, of the exiles in London, met several stages which were from praise to the author's analysis of the previous Vienna Congress and consequences for Europe and the world to repudiation by the analysis of the French author made to the case of the inversion of relations between Portugal and Brazil. The originality of this situation had taken the Prat to the assertion that Portugal has gone from metropolis to colony. If at first the going to of court to Brazil and its ascent to kingdom was applauded by the liberal and the current that had plans to establish a Brazilian empire was supported. Shortly after the publication of the Prat statement, the position of these authors was altered due mainly to the reading of José Suárez Dedo's work called considerations about the location of the Portuguese monarchy. This work not only explained the importance of the center of power being in, in Lisbon, but also emerged as an alternative to the colonial model Portuguese proposed, proposed by min Minister Rodrigo Sousa Coutinho, who argued that the seat of the monarchy could be anywhere in the empire, provided that it it guaranteed its unity while intending to extend the Brazilian territory to the north, envisioning a Brazilian empire as the seat of the Portuguese monarchy. Suarez Vid, for his part, proposed another model that, like the United States, would constitute a federation led from Lisbon, and it is this position and in in its consequences that many liberals will def defend and explain in doctrine in newspapers throughout the period preceding and during the liberal revolutions. The representations of the colony in the first liberal parliament was one of the discussions that opened the debate in the constituent court beginning on January 6, 1821, in which we are able to follow through the Diário das Cortes. According to the editorial committee, this official newspaper was created to be a reliable source and thus keep the people informed of what was what happening was happening in parliament. Sorry, there is an echo. And on the other hand, to prevent slander from spreading, slander from spreading in the press as 
as to what was said in the House of Representatives. The way of functioning of the journal was several times discussed in the sections of Parliament and reported in the journal. And the editorial committee played an important role in the debate for the law of freedom of the press. As an example of this mutual vigilance, the fact that when some members of the Parliament opposed that proposals who were defeated should not should be published, the editorial committee strongly opposed because they, they thought it was important to be known to all Portuguese the various positions in debate, even those defeated. This position won by a majority in the Liberal Parliament. Returning now to the House and to the debate of the basis of the future constitution with which the constituting courts began, on January 30, 1821, by the hand of MP Bento Pereira do Carmo, was launched to discussion a proposal about including colonies representation in Parliament. The proposal and the memory attached revealed many of the lines of the debate on the colonial issues and the empire concept that went through all the 19th century and renewed in the beginning of the 20s with the first Portuguese Republic. To maintain the, integ to maintain the integrity of the Portuguese empire and the avoidance of revolutionary situation as presented to Britain and Spanish were the main reason that Bento uh, presented in the memory of the proposal. Those reasons were then decomposed in other ones that joined the common history of the empire and the common interests that should unify the colonial and metropolitan elites around the fundamental laws being made in parliament. The common interests were resumed by the MP as we have been commenting, the colonies should buy or should bought the metropolitan products and Lisbon should be again the European Emporium that once was before the treaties that granted foreigner freedom of trade with Brazil. Fernando Tomás, the patriarch of Portuguese liberalism intervened in this sense with the report of the state of the nation presented in parliament that January. The preamble of, ben of Bento do Carmo Pereira proposal about the need of colonial representation adopt the liberal discourse in defense of individual freedom against despotism of absolute monarchies. As the major part of the liberals, the author defended that only in defeating despotism was possible to end with revolutions. That is, as the Prague and most liberals he defended, that the revolution was not the cause but the consequence. In that way, the presence of MPs from the colonies was essential. As the time of travel, from, as the time of travel, travel from Asia, Africa, and South America was incompatible with the planned timetable and the rush to approve the basis of the constitution, the core of the Bento do Carmo proposition was that a list of deputy substitutes of each colony but living in Portugal was prepared and then called to house. And as soon the arrival of the elected members, they would step out. Several deputies manifested their agreement with the election of colonial representatives, but the idea of founding substitutes until they arrived to Lisbon was dismissed. The debate around the colonial theme shows that only the colonial elites will take part in the electoral processed as voters and as electors. The reported, as reported by the Diário de Cortes, the base or, or main principles of the future constitutional constitution were finally approved in April 1821 with no representation from overseas. The nation was then defined as the union of all Portuguese from both hemispheres and the sovereignty re resided in, that, in the nation as such. The fundamental law of the nation was assumed as made by the representatives of Portugal, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Portugal, and that will be common to all of the other three parts of the world as soon as their representatives accepted, accepted and declared that was their will. 
the excluded from the electoral process would be defined later by the constitution, but it was decided that there will be excluded by economical and educational and social positions. All these discussions had begun to circulate over the empire and caused several movements of support of the liberal revolution. News arrived in the Diário de Cortes that first in Brazil, Bahia, Pará and Pernambuco had imposed the new regime and wanted to send represent representatives to Lisbon. In the end of April, the king was still in Brazil and finally accepted and recognized the constitutive power of the Liberal Assembly in Portugal. Later in Angola, Mozambique and Goa, similar actions took place against the local absolute powers in favor of liberal constitution. The liberal revolutions and the declaration of independence of Brazil took the colonial debate to other levels within the same themes, but it, where equality, citizenship, autonomy, liberation and emancipation were discussed both in press and parliament. It is a work angle yet to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Adelaide. Uh, Adelaide, Dr. Mires has spoken about the origin of the constitutional text as being in the Napoleonic code and has spoken about how these ideas reach the Iberian Peninsula and how this liberal constitution of 1822 affected the colonial issue and the struggle between the metropolis and the colonies. Thank you, Dr. Machado. I now call upon uh, Dr. Sharmila Pais. She is our second speaker. Dr. Sharmila Pais is an associate professor in history in St. Xavier's College, Mapsa. She has published recently her book entitled The Encounter with the Ballot in Colonial Goa, a historical and analytical perspective, 1822 to 1961. She has participated in international, national, and state level seminars and has several research publications to her credit. She is also an organizing member of this seminar. Over to you, Dr. Paish. Thank you, Dr. Sushila. Greetings, greetings to my fellow part panelists and participants. Today, I'm going to present my paper titled The Changing Tone of Language of the Official Press in Portuguese India, 1822 to 1837. This paper investigates two official newspapers to explore their tone of language and the nature of information they conveyed to the public in Portuguese India from 1822 to 1837. The observations expressed in this paper are based on the study of two official newspapers, the Gazeta de Goa and the Chronica, and additionally, the Echo de Lusitania that was also printed in the government printing press. The Gazeta de Goa and the Chronica were the outcome of the liberal era of the 19th century. I argue here that the language of these newspapers was shaped by the political events of the 19th century in Portugal and in colonial Goa, and the editors who oversaw them or directed these publications. Historically, we know that the press in colonial Goa served as the voice of the government and reflected its imperial objectives. To understand the nature of these official periodicals and their contents, one has to understand the political situation in Portugal and colonial Goa. In the 19th century, the constitutional regime was inaugurated in Portugal and her overseas provinces after the liberal revolution of 1820 and was theoretically based on new maxims characterizing the liberal spirit of this period. In a well-organized coup, Conde Leopard was deposed from power in September 1821. It was followed by the establishment of the first provisional government, which took the name of Junta Provisional de Govern de India in 1821. Unfortunately, the first Junta ran in rough waters, and subsequently, the second Junta Provisional was established by its decree 
of December 12, 1821, this government announced its publication, the Gazette of the Goa. The official printing press was brought from Bombay and became functional immediately after it reached Goa the same month, along with its compositor Manuel La Cruz, with the necessary tools, oil, and dyes. It was set up in the warehouse of the governor's palace. It displayed the phrase "Na impresa ang gobyerno," produced in the government press. The Gazeta was a weekly and brought out in print every Saturday. It began its publication on 22nd December 2022. An analysis of the Gazeta reveals that it was a political periodical with a liberal and a secular tone. Its editorials and some of its features. Distinctly reflected the ideology of the second provisional government in colonial India. It marked the reversal of the press culture of the previous era of the absolute monarchy, where the publication tone was largely religious in nature. The Gazette of the Goa was edited by Dr. Lima Leta, a liberal who had embraced ideas of Freemasonry and liberalism much before coming to colonial Goa. His his short stay in Paris. for some time influenced his thought process considerably dr leta also took part in the removal of viceroy kondu riopard in the wake of the liberal revolution he also suffered disillusionment for having been kept out of the first provisional junta this was a phase of intrigues and counter intrigues to which dr lima leta was a witness he was included in the second junta provisional and subsequently made the editor of the gazeta it was under these circumstances and despite his short stint he played a role in setting up the tone of the gazeta information published in the gazeta was looked upon as being official and the gazeta was the official voice of the government an analysis of the weekly shows that it brought out in print deliberations of the government information on the holy house of mercy it published news from the metropolis europe brazil and other parts of the world the weekly not only carried information as a narrative or a news bulletin but it analyzed events and provided opinion on important issues happening in goa it also had information on electoral decrees or official decrees which were termed as articles to officio electoral legislations pertaining to the elections of the parliamentarians to the cortes were published on the eve of every parliamentary election it was also critical of the administration of the first provisional government dr lima leta had to depart to portugal on account of his election to the portuguese parliament and consequently we know that luis pratis de almeida albuquerque served as its editor luis pratis was a liberal and an avid supporter of the freedom of the press as expected it echoed the objectives and sentiments of the provisional government it was a time also when there were so many political incidents happening in the territory the vacant place of Dr. Lima Leta was filled by the co-opted member and a Luso descendant, Joki Morao Gasesh Palya, and this decision did not have the approval of the Guan elite, resulting in rebellion and the use of military force by the government to quell this revolt. Under these circumstances, the Gazeta condemned the measures of factionalism. It highlighted the misgivings of the rebels and their military battalion. It also gave an opportunity to the local elite to apprise themselves of the working on the colonial government during the constitutional regime some of its feature features show an inclination towards the legitimization of the provisional government that is the uh, second junta provisional under his excellency dr manuel the camera it explained this courtesy's experience by Dr. Lima Leta and his ordeal of being treated as the enemy of the nation by the first junta. It provided detailed accounts of the infantry battalion stationed at various places, and called upon the factions of the state to maintain peace. In one of its articles published in May, eighteen twenty-two, it called it 
it declared that it called upon to retain the principles of the government in the metropolis without the use of arms especially to the military to establish peace in the province which was perturbed by violence it it also reported on the need to follow laws of the metropolis and be steadfast to the promise of fidelity that the military ranks in the region were ignoring there is an interesting article which talks about from the new padru as he returns to goa in february 1822 this interesting article appeals to the public to express their complaints while kondurio pad is in goa and not after he leaves the province so can so that he can defend his stand taken by him earlier let us to the editor featured either in anonymity or without maintaining secrecy it carried also obituaries of high ranking officials and military men simultaneously there were other issues happening in the political circles of goa goa witnessed a very volatile situation unfortunately for, for the liberals there was a resurgence of the absolutists back to power in portugal in 1823 under dom miguel resulting in the subordination of the of the liberals in goa under these circumstances the spirit of conservatism was setting in and the gazeta was losing its liberal favor especially after the death of its editor luis prats dalmeda in 1826 and more so when the viceroy dom manuel de camara died the government was then entrusted to a governing council and different officials there was a fear among the conservative section that the gazeta might publish something unsavory attacking the clergymen and government officials and the publication of the gazeta was suspended by the order of the governing council dated august 1826 that stated that the government had always functioned without the press and without the gazette until the unfortunate time of the revolution after a small hiatus of the government printing press it was once again revived in 1835 with the help of new types and other implements of the provisional government ze anise the silva was appointed as the editor of the press and it was termed as the chronicle constitucional de goa it was the second official publication but was subject to stringent measures from the government by an official order dated 12 june 1835 that censored the press for instance any manuscript pertaining to the doctrines and principles of the roman catholic church had to be sent to church authorities nothing should could be published in any manner that could harm the person of the king or that of the crown prince and these are some of the measures which i do not in short there was stringent press censorship during this period The Chronicle was published from 1835 and lasted till 1837, and was edited by the Silva. It had the status of the official document as mentioned earlier, and was published by the Imprenta Nacional. As a mouthpiece of the government, it aimed to protect the image of the absolutist government. This newspaper served also to counter the press activities of the Goans in Bombay and Daman. anonymous letters criticizing the portuguese government that appeared in bombay publications such as the bombay courier and the bombay examiner were attacked by the chronicle it published letters of anonymity refuting the falsities that were spread by editors across the neighboring territories on the contrary the paper exalted the virtues and efficiency of the governor of goa along with the chronicle there was another publication the echo de lusitania <clears throat> which was also edited by zay anisset de silva it bore an official stamp and was printed also in the government printing press now together both these newspapers they served as the mouth pieces of the government <clears throat> they published editorials and updates on the political scenario of goa they reflected the ideology of the luso descendants and the portuguese administrators 
In fact, one may confidently say that the Chronicle was brought into print to respond to the journalistic challenges of the Goan elite outside Portuguese India. The periodicals accused Verna Perez de Silva and several other Goan elite for satisfying their personal ambition and negotiating their own interests with the metropolitan government in a very shrewd manner. One can distinctly recognize the sense of alienation and indignity experienced by the conservative section and the mistis community. There were recurring articles which occupied <coughs> space on the public administration. And one can distinctly visualize the race-based tensions <coughs> in the Guan society in the 19th century. <laughs> These newspapers question how the family of Bernard Perisha Silva had reigned over a small territory when there were so many other qualified and deserving Europeans and Luso descendants, and none of them had deserved even a small gain of the 19th century. In the coming months, one sees that Perisha Silva was accused of promoting nepotism, misuse of power, and arbitrary actions during his. Uh, prefecture. It was ex also expressed that the reforms of Parish were mainly directed against the Luso descendants and the white class who were contemptuously referred to as Mistishu, spelt with M I S T I C Cedilla O S and Kashtishu. Further, the Goans were accused of being ungrateful to a heroic nation which had permitted them parity in administration. Parity in administration. This period was considered as a horrifying era where the satellites of the ex-prefect were singing praises of their victory and trying to exterminate the Portuguese and the descendants. The defamatory act attacks of the Perinos, as they were called, became a major concern for the European class and the Luso descendants. Substantial amount of space was spent, was devoted on the subject of the prefecture, which featured time and again recurrently. Also, an overwhelming number of articles were loaded with resentment against the Goan elite. For instance, there were articles on the days of anarchy and persecution, or certain articles titled as Events of Goa, which were once again Bernard Perish de Silva and his supporters were subjects of intense discussion. It was sound offensive to the common sense, they said, that Perish de Silva should have been considered to the position of a prefect and the rest should have been discred uh, discredited. A, 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 dis a dismay invaded the pride of some aristocrats, seeing the elevation of a man who they not only ignored but also despised. The army officials and the government officials also decried his nomination and all these articles, they feature in the official press. I do not wish to uh, give an account of each and every article, but I think in conclusion, what I, I, I would say is that the tone of liberalism of the official periodical, which was initiated with the Gazette of the Goa in 1822, diluted with every passing year due to political circumstances occurring in Portugal and the overseas colony, especially colonial Goa. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila. Sharmila's paper has spoken about the Gazeta, the Goa, the Chronica, as well as a paper, Echo de Lusitania. Now, this is a good precursor for the paper that is to follow because one finds that though it was a liberal period, it was not to suggest that the press was in any case liberal as far as the Goans were concerned. She also speaks about how this period from 1822 to 1837 was different from the absolute monarchy period before that which gave a lot of importance to the religious. Now we go on to our next speaker, Mr. Frederick, Dr. Frederick Narona. Dr. Narona is a journalist 
alternative publisher and independent researcher. He has a doctorate in English from the Goa University, which focuses on the 20th century publishing in Goa. He has conceptualized and edited the book in black and white, Voices from the Press in Goa. He has founded he has founded the Goa 1556 alternative publishing venture, which has published about 150 books related to Goa in the last decade and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have the paper Paradoxes of the Colonial Press presented by Dr. Frederick Narona. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Sar uh, thank you, Dr. Suchila. Uh, I just want to confirm that uh, my presentation has come on, if it has, or not yet, and that my sound can be heard. It has come. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's it. In academia, there are a lot of serious talks. So, so ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, let me begin with with something on a slightly lighter note which uh, might seem unacademic, but as we go along, you'll understand the context. So I started off in journalism at the age of 19, and we had a joke among us in those days. We used to say that uh, the best stories actually found in the waste paper basket of the editor. So, you know, although, although we were working for, for a very kind of uh, liberal and outspoken paper, there are still a whole lot of stories which cannot be told and which are not told. So my concern is how does academia, which does a good job on its own, reach out to these untold stories? That, that's, that's one of the challenges. And uh, to continue in that vein, yesterday, uh, Professor Cielo uh, made this point about ORLs and its uh, multilingual masthead, multilingual masthead, uh, you know, which has the shrunken O's so you can read it both, you can read the name both as ORLs, or if you are reading it as English, the O's are shrunken enough to read as Herald, okay? Uh, I, I, I don't for a moment mean to criticize uh, Dr. Cielo or her scholarship, which I have very high respect for, and she, she has done a lot of work on Goa, which, which is really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit to that story. Uh, her point on multilingualism of the press and all is very valid. We are a multilingual society, we have to be that. Uh, but here in this case, there is a different angle and it may surprise you when you come to know the story. So, for instance, uh, the O's, the shrunken O's before the name actually came about because of this. In those days, all presses, newspaper presses depended on the government for their newsprint allocation. So, if, if they showed that they were a, news, a new newspaper, they would have a problem and they would not get that newsprint allocation. So, they, they uh, some brilliant designer a guy called the name by the name of Adolf actually. He he stuck on this idea of shrinking these O's and, and uh, reducing it to to read both as Herald and O Herald. So so in that sense, these are the these are the these are the untold stories of the press. That's just a little bit to bring in some 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 light relief and things like that. But now to get to the topic. I hope my uh, slides are moving. Is it moving? Hello. Yes, yes, they, they are, are Frederick. Yeah. They are. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Cielo. Uh, so, so just to to take a wider perspective first, I'm quoting Henry Scholberg here, who was a former director, the late Henry Scholberg, a very colorful personality. Read all about him on the net, about his uh, experience with World War II and uh, undergoing starvation experiments and all. I will not go into that, but he put the point very well when he said that Goa is an area of approximately the size of an Indian district. And out of this area came 300 journals in the course of 140 years. And uh, there were some 340 different titles as, as, he, as he mentioned it. Of course, he also elsewhere raises the point of why these, why these titles were so short-lived and he dismisses that, which is another interesting aspect. He makes the point that uh, while we forget it now, journalism in Portuguese India had a lot of diversity. So there were journals in Konkani, in Marathi, in English. There were political, literary, scientific, legal, historical, and religious journals. There were also periodicals devoted to women, to sport, to hygiene, to agriculture, and even to satire. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, this is a duplicate. Uh, 
I, I am trying to argue here today that there are certain paradoxes which have not been answered, which have not been looked at adequately. And I would just like to raise a few bullet points without taking too much of your time or overstepping the time limits given to us. And uh, the, 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 the points I'm trying to make is, is the need for preserving what we have, uh, understanding the persona involved in, 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 uh, in this, uh, this field, Understanding the politics involved and also trying to, to, to break up the different periods that we have been through and to understand what is the speciality of each of these. So, so of course, uh, the issue of preserving, many academicians have highlighted this. We don't discuss it enough, enough in Goa. There is a need for physical protection, protection of, the, of, the, of, the, of the periodical press. Uh, I think I, I missed out on that quote somehow where, where Dr. Stuhlberg himself says that uh, many of these journals are just rotting away in Goa because of the pressures of monsoonal India in that sense. Monsoonal climate of India is actually affecting a whole lot of, a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, periodicals which, which, which in many cases are the only copies which deserve to be preserved. And of course, there is a shortage of local researchers that no one will deny. Everyone knows it. Most of the research going on is by foreign scholars. We cannot blame the foreign scholars if we are doing little or nothing ourselves. And uh, beside that, the issue of language, which CLO raised, Dr. CLO raised so, so articulately yesterday. Uh, I think, you know, it shocked me the other day to read that among the endangered languages in the world is the Portuguese language in Goa. I'm not saying it out of any loose nostalgia or anything of that sort. But, uh, but it is a fact that our history and our and and also you know a lot of our, our uh, past is caught up in this language and it is a is a definite need for us to understand and learn it okay uh, also the kind of uh, first in the press that we forget there are many achievements that the, that the goa press has kind of achieved but uh, sometime in the hurry to 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 you know see everything in quick uh, shades of black and white, we kind of overlook the realities that uh, that that uh, that are part of our history. So, for example, uh, you know there are there is this listing again from Scholberg, who talks about uh, the first scientific journal published in '62, the first journal for women in the same year, uh, the first Marathi journal in '72, and uh, the first journal with an English section in 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 '72, 1872. The first English newspaper in 1885 and the first daily, which is still around in 1900. Of course, there are other paradoxes of languages also, which, which, which need to be noticed and discussed. Uh, for instance, the, the issue of language. The issue of language is an is, is a issue which is not adequately addressed. So I think uh, Dr. Sharmila Pais's recent book gives a very insightful understanding of uh, the role Marathi played, for example, even during the Portuguese time, not, not, not only after 61, as some of us tend to think. So uh, Marathi got, got a prominence even during Portuguese time for, for various historical reasons, which, which is outlined in her book quite well. And, uh, you know, Konkani as a newspaper comes much later. It comes only in, 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 the, in, in the 1900s, whereas a full English paper comes about in 1885 called the Times of Goa. So, so you know, I think we are not we are not kind of uh, looking at these realities strongly enough. So, Liliadar Kense, who is one of the scholars who has done a very interesting and elaborate uh, study on uh, Indo-Portuguese literary journals, uh, has noted that although readership was limited in the 19th century, Goa has a, had a total of 20 periodicals that can be classified as literary journals alone. So his uh, his uh, study is quite detailed, and uh, unfortunately, because it falls in between the in between all the gaps, so it is uh, written about Portuguese uh, Goa, but it is in the English language. So I don't know whether it's got adequately noticed or, or what. Okay, so then there is also sorry, uh, I need to just uh, mention. Yeah, while on this point, I need to go back a bit, and uh, we. We spoke about the, the gaps between Marathi, Konkani, and Portuguese, and how the languages played out differently at different points in the in the colonial era. Okay, uh, when I was doing my thesis on uh, book publishing, actually not newspaper publishing, I was surprised to realize that within the 20th century alone, the dominant language 
uh, in Goa has changed on at least four to five different occasions, from uh, from Portuguese to to uh, to Konkani, a bit of Konkani to English, uh, Romi Konkani to English to Devanagari Konkani, then Marathi, sorry Marathi before that, and then Devanagari Konkani. So so these language shifts and the power of different languages has a crucial impact in uh, in 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 uh, who are the dominant players in the local press that is what what i would agree or what i would argue and uh, at the same time uh, you know we we also have the issue of dialect so for example till today the dialect of sasti for example i'm not talking about script here script is a totally different uh, debate which has been addressed uh, by different persons including uh, jason keith fernandez and things like that uh, though i have a difference of opinion with that perspective uh but apart from apart from from uh, script there is issue of dialect so for instance uh, while while the romi writers would have a problem with devnagari writers today uh, they see no reason why Sals sasti dialect the dialect of salset region should be given any any place in the world of romi kokni writing for instance and uh, this is quite surprising if you consider that the Sasti dialect was the dominant, dominant Konkani dialect in between the 15th and the 17th century, when when it was written in and published in. Today you will not find a single book written in 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 Sasti. It is a language uh, kept only for theat for the theat uh, stage and that too only for comedians on the theat stage. So 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 there are problems there. Uh, the diaspora press is also not not understood adequately. Uh, so we've uh, it's basically understudied and un, un, uh, underdocumented and unheard. We've had uh, papers like the Goan Voice. Uh, I'm not talking about the modern Goan Voice, which comes out from UK. I'm talking about the Goan Voice from East Africa, after which the modern modern Goan Voice is named. And uh, you've had you've had Roti, you've had Examiner, uh, which have a Goan influence. Roti, of course, is hundred years old, and it has it was started in Karachi, moves to Bombay, and then shifts shifts back to Goa. So it's a very strange kind of. Uh, reality the goan world was totally forgotten till a few years back it is actually a precursor of uh, of uh, you know yesterday we were talking about goa today and its role as a magazine of record uh, and of course uh, it has played a useful role no doubt the goan world was about 30 or 35 years before that and it had a very similar model wherein it would report from what was happening from different parts of the goan diasporic world uh, in different uh, you know areas of the of the of the of of the Goan community and the diaspora. Uh, of course, in terms of the personalities dominating the press, that is something which is waiting to be understood. Uh, whom did the press represent and where? Okay, there are there are there are various uh, kind of theories and perspectives on this, and each one the 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 strange thing is that each one is convincing in itself, but but you know. You can look approach this issue from any perspective. So, for example, uh, we all know that the 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 colonial interest and the local elites had a very strange and and and, and unstudied unstudied kind of equation. So here again, I would point to uh, to Dr. Sharmila's writing on it, which I found quite insightful myself. And uh, you know the way she explains it is is interesting. Uh, the whole issue of caste in the press. Okay, uh, how do we understand that? Rochelle Pinto has fascinating uh, insights into the the role of the of the Catholic subaltern in Bombay in the twentieth century, and uh, there are there are other equally uh, you know opposite explanations for caste alliances within Goa, for example. Uh, Ashok Rao Kavi, who has written journalistically, not not academically, has a fascinating insight into the caste politics of the language controversy in the 1980s. So, so in that sense, there are all these uh, these un, un, unexplained issues which are not yet studied, not yet looked at. In terms of personalities, we know, like for example, that the press in Goa stopped between 1985 to 1987 because of the Rane revolt. Okay. Uh, till date, the Ranes are playing an important role in 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 Goan politics, and uh, somehow there is no connection being seen between uh, 
uh, this reality and 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 the earlier realities. So so you know I'm just flagging these issues as as worthy of studying. I think there is also you know the disconnect between transitions in politics and the impact it has on the press. Uh, there is a total lack of studies on the media in Goa, both pre-61 and post-61. Uh, post-61, there are there there have hardly been two or three major seminars on this topic, which which is strange because uh, the media controls the public opinion in a huge way, and it has hardly been studied. Apart from one seminar at the Kepe Government College and one maybe at the Xavier Center, uh, there are hardly any studies on it. Uh, there is a lot of romanticization of the press history. For instance. Uh, just yesterday, we were raising the point where uh, what was the role of the Indian government, say, in the in the in the press of the freedom fighters of of Goa, in that sense. Uh, what was the role of the colonial state in uh, in propping up or or you know, kind of uh, uh, taking off on certain certain uh, governments, uh, certain newspapers. So so all these kind of. Uh, uh, issues have have not been adequately looked looked at. I would I would argue. So uh, you you we've had transition points in 1961, for example, where at one stage I did a, a small paper on the way uh, you know the the controversy that led to the closing down of Herald, not not the Portuguese paper O Herald, but the closing down of Herald. And if you read the politics in that, it's quite strange and amazing that what went into creating it. Of course, these transition points happen with every every shift in politics. So even even in post liberation Goa, if you have a transition in 1980 or transition in 2000 or in 2012, you find that the media also gets affected uh, sub subsequently. And uh, yeah, just to 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 wind up my short presentation, I would say that uh, you know yeah, the, some of the points that I've already made, we we need to look at both the pre 1961 and the post 1961 periods, and uh, we need to look at some misleading claims made today today every one in the in the press likes to claim that they were nationalists and they were pro india and things like that but any look at it would know that they were taking different sides at different points of time so uh, you know uh, i i just need to go through my yeah so 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 basically i'm trying to say that uh, we've had a lot of issues which we don't quite understand and we need to be looking at those in in a little uh, bit more of detail i will come back in the question and answer session and i'll be quite happy to 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 add more details which i missed out now thanks so much thank you dr narona uh, frederick narona has uh, pointed out in detail the paradoxes of the colonial press. He has spoken about the different periods from 1862 to uh, 1885. It is surprising to know that the first journal of English was in 1872, and there was really a journal with regard to women. Now, uh, he has spoken about Liliadar Fame, saying, in fact, he was to appear on this panel if it was not for the 13 and a half hour uh, hours difference between California and uh, and this timing. Uh, Dr. Norona speaks of the romanticization of the press history, a very interesting uh, point made in his paper on paradoxes. And uh, he feels that there is an inadequate representation of or studies done about uh, the press. Uh, we will leave that for a later discussion. Now we have our next speaker from Brazil, uh, Sibeli Aldrovandi. And Sibeli has, uh, is an archaeologist. Uh, she's an art historian. And she has completed her third postdoctoral research project at the Department of Classical and Vernacular Languages in 2020. Currently, she is associate researcher of the Pensado de Goa of the University of Sao Paulo. Today, Sibel will speak about her topic. Uh, she will introduce her topic to you, and it is on the bylaws of the Bulletin Oficial 
an investigation into the fleeing goddesses of colonial Goa. Over to you, Sibel. Sibeli. Thank you, Sushila. Um, good, good morning to everyone, to all the participants. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Professor Sushila, Dr. Sharmila, Dr. Frederick, for inviting me to present at this uh, webinar on the bicentenary of the Gazeta de Goa. It has been also a pleasure to listen to all the participants during these two days. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Um, this investigation presents the results of a systematic survey and the detailed analysis on all data collected from the compromises or bylaws of the temples of female deities available in the Bulletin Oficial published from the end of the 19th century onwards. The publication of these particular documents through the periodical press is a fundamental ref reference for reconstructing the official sacred laid landscape of Hindu gods and goddesses in contemporary Goa, particularly those associated with goddess Santeri and Shantadurga, the most popular deities among them. This is the portion of the Hindu sacred landscape that possesses regulatory uh, statutes officially registered by the state, as opposed to the temples that do not have officially registered statutes in Goa. Today, um, we look at, uh, I'm, I'm hearing an echo. Maybe. Today, we look at a specific aspect of the official data provided by these bylaws, the fleeing goddesses of Goa, that allows mapping these past flows from the Velhas Conquistas to the neighboring territories, later known as Novas Conquistas, and which contributed to reshaping the contemporary Goan sacred landscape. Um, the Tipografia Nacional, uh, the National Press, or the Imprensa Nacional, the National Printing Office, that is the official printing press in Goa, sponsored by the Portuguese government, published the first issue of the Boletim do Governo dos Estados da Índia on December 1837. Before the Boletim do Governo, there have been two earlier publications in Portuguese. Uh, in Portuguese India for official ends, the Gazeta de Goa, published since December 1821, and the Crónica Constitucional, published uh, since July 1835. As noted by Sandra Atay de Lobo in 2017, this initiative was followed by the Imprensa Nacional and the Boletim do Governo, established after, after the arrival of the new Governor General in India. Over the years, this Boletim was renamed a few times until it was fin finally um, named the Boletim Oficial do Estado da Índia, published from 1935, 39, sorry, to 1961. In 1961, after Goa became part of India again, up to 1965, it was called the Government Gazette, Boletim Oficial, the, govern the go Government of India. In 1966, it was named, its name was changed again to the Government Gazette, Boletim Oficial, the Government of Goa, Daman and Dio, and from 1987 onwards, it has been called the official Gazette, Government of Goa, as it is called until the present. 
it started as a weekly publication. Let it let, later it was published bi-weekly and tri-weekly until it became a daily publication, changing its frequency of publication according to the needs of each period. Um, sorry. As, um, as explained by Taiji Lobo, uh, the official control of the press in Goa was maintained through the monopoly of printing of printing by the Imprensa Nacional. According to her, and I quote, governmental printing presses and bulletins born to publicize the acts of authority and relevant legislation introduced the apparatus of liberal governance in these regions, in which transparent public action and the publication of laws were considered essential. Simultaneously, it established an official political and cultural discourse in such spaces." End of quote. The Portarias and Compromissos of the Hindu Temples started being published in the Bulletin Oficial during the 1880s. The Compromissos of the Hindu Temples were originally published in the Series 1 of the Bulletin Oficial, the main part of legislative nature, containing rules and stationary acts, regulations, orders, bylaws, and notifications. Since 1973, the temple bylaws have been published in the Series 3 of the Government Gazette. The compromises were early, originally published in Portuguese, later they became bilingual from 1961 to 1965, published in English and Portuguese, but after 65 they were printed only in English, up to 1983. During 1983 they began to include translations of the orders and bylaws in Marathi, following the English version. And from 1984 onwards, most of the popular of, of the bylaws were published both in English and Marathi, although a few remained published only in English. Once published in the Bulletin Oficial, these temple statutes that earlier had only private, religious, and local character acquired public authority as they became registered as institutional lingual documents by the state and thus began to be publicized by the official press throughout Goa. Though written initially only in Portuguese, once the compromises were made known and circulate, circulated among the Portuguese speaking elites in Goa, they achieved at least two main purposes. The first one of publicly registering the temple regulations according to what had been established by the temple Mazania. And the second one of legitimizing at the same time whatever had been registered in those statutes once published by the Bulletin Oficial. The content of these compromises is quite diverse, but due to, the, to their official character, they follow certain conventional parameters. The information that concerns us today is usually found in the first chapter, called the Institution of the Temple, containing data on the transfer of the deities during the 16th century to its new temple. Criteria used in the survey of the compromises included only the temples in Goa, whose main deity is female. After repeated revisions, the total number of official statutes of temples dedicated to these goddesses published in the Bulletin Officiais from 1882 to 2007 comes to 92 goddesses. Among them, 46 are specifically consecrated to Santeri, which are 15, and uh, Santa Durga, which are, uh, are 31. The remaining 46 are dedicated to other female deities. Perhaps one of the most interesting data clusters provided by the compromises is the information on what is known as the diaspora of the deities as described by Axelrod and Frisch, also known as the forced exile of the deities as depicted by Robert Newman. During the destruction, this 
occurred during the destruction of the ancient temples cape in the various conquistas. During a religious persecution in the 16th century, these migrant gods and goddesses had to flee to their neighboring territories. And as stated by Pratima Kamat, they encircled Christian Goa by an arc of resurrected temples dotting the Portuguese borders. As Portuguese colonial power developed in Goa and with the silencing of the Hindu built environment in the Velhas Conquistas, a new topography of colonial power and rep representation was established with the intention of taming the pre existing spatial narrative thus consistently replacing the previous temples with colonial churches. During this process, a specific dynamic of flows, as in Apadurai, involving those uh, diasporic deities was created, reconfiguring the Hindu templescapes both then and now. In order to escape Portuguese policies, some deities were moved only a few miles while others were taken much further away. Although scholars, as Axelrod and all others, have constantly reiterated the mass exit of deities from virtually every village in Goa, up to the present, this dynamic of flows has not been consistently assembled or studied. The information provided by the Compromissus now systematized, sheds light on the official number of female deities transferred across the borders, allowing us to map and to quantify more effectively this whole phenomenon. Therefore, even in, if part of these stories remain officially untold, as some of the deities that managed to escape colonial persecution are nowadays in temples without official statutes or have been taken to neighboring states, these compromises are the main existing documents for reconstructing the historic and spatial narratives from the 16th century onwards regarding the diaspora of the Goan gods and goddesses. Most of these diasporic deities are still worshipped in contemporary temples in, Novas in the Novas Conquistas, though a few have eventually returned to the Velhas Conquistas in new temples. While most compromises explicitly record the transferring of the deities, explaining from which village they came and when, where they went, some of them only provide indirect data. They do not refer to the deity itself, but mention the villages from where the Mahajans of the temples origi originally were. As time is short, I'm not going through all details of each diasporic deity here, but I will provide the main quantities and discuss a few interesting aspects related to them. Um, the number of compromises containing information on the transfer of female deities amounts to 31, and the total number of primary deities officially recorded as having been shifted from the Velhas Conquistas is 32, as the temple of Budo Avedin in Kepeng houses two primary deities. Thus indicating that the other 60 deities with temple com compromises were prob probably already part of that sacred landscape. Santeri in particular, in particular, had uh, 78 temples in the Velhas Conquistas, and among them, at least four, 14 were transferred to other locations where they remain in primary temples dedicated to this goddess. Thus, out of 92 temples with compromises, at least 34.78% of the female official templescape in Goa belongs to diasporic deities, which is in itself a considerable amount. According to the compromises, the districts in the neighboring regions that received more deities were Ponda with 13, Bicholin with 8, Pernin with 7, and Kepeng with 3. And there was a deity, Goddess Mahalakshmi, who initially fled to Bicholin and later went back to Ilias. In the Velhas Conquistas, the district with most diasporic deities was Bardes with 16, followed by Salsetti, 
with nine and Ilios with seven female deities, clean, clean female deities. Temples in Goa, uh, Goa's neighboring states, Karnataka and Maharashtra, also housed some diasporic deities from the various conquistas. For instance, Goddess Shantadurga from Nagoa in Salset, praised in the Nagavya Mahatmya of the Sahyadri Kanda, is housed in Ankola. And Shri Lakshmi at the Shri Lakshmi Narayana Mahamaya Temple, um, where she is worshipped as Shri Mahamaya. In the Foral de Salset, she was called Santeri. While Goddess Bhagavati went to Marshall in Ponda, where she resides in the temple with no official statute. Another goddess, known as Cantarosa Devi in the Foral de Salset from Benaulin, Panauli, uh, moved to Aversa near Ancola and is housed at the Shri Katyayani Baneshwar temple, where she is worshipped as Shri Katyayani, a form of goddess Durga also. In other instances, the compromissus mention goddesses who might have originally been uh, the main deity of their villages, but during persecution ended up as secondary deities enshrined in another temple, probably because they were received in an already existing temple as an affi affiliated version of other male of, or female deities, uh, affiliated deity, no? Some temples were later established in the various conquistas, few of them with the original image, but most housing a new representation of the goddess, as in Kalanguchi and other temples without official statutes. Some of these deities have remained in the districts where they took refugee in the 16th century, but they visit their original villages during specific festivals. Therefore, these processions are a devotional exercise that can be seen, as described by Corrigan, as something of the manner in which spatial ambiguity and spatial definitiveness cooperate in the workings of the religious imagination. Although the information provided in the temple bylaws does not comprise all female deities that have actually been transferred during religious persecution, systematization of the data retrieved from these bylaws with subsequent mapping and quantification allow us to better understand this complex diasporic network and the dynamic of religious flows, an intricate web of fleeing deities configured and reconfigured between the Velias and the Novas Conquistas. The construction of new temples and the consecration of the fleeing deities outside Portuguese territory, which has seen accounts for at least one third of the contemporary female official temples, was accompanied by an increase in the power of all local elites, notwithstanding the religious fragmentation promoted by the colonial state. To conclude, um, I would like to say uh, that the investigation presented today would not have been made possible without the use of the temple compromises or bylaws that were published in the Bulletin Oficial from 1881 to uh, 2007. These bylaws composed and published in the official press since the end of the 19th century by the elites who could write in Portuguese helped establish a peculiar form of religious spatial narrative, creating an official templescape in Goa that at the same time contributed to its own legitimization. Changes in the language used in, to publish these compromises and bylaws, first in Portuguese, later in English, and then also in Marathi, have also contributed to creating and reaffirming a clear distinction between the colonial and post-colonial period, changing from Portuguese to India, rule in Goa. Thus, these bylaws have also been instrumental to bolstering the Goan Hindu identity, which once saw a great part of its ancient templescape nearly silenced. Thank you. Thank you, Sibeli. Uh, it has been a very enlightening discussion on the bylaws in the Bulletin Official, and it is very uh, important that we understand that this is a source text for
for studying about the diaspora of the gods and goddesses of Goa. It's interesting to know that uh, from 1837 onwards till 1961 and thereafter, you have so many, uh, so many, so much information about the clean goddesses. Thank you, Sibeli. Uh, now the, the stage is open for discussion. And the first question in the chat box is written by uh, Sandra, and uh, it is addressed to Adelaide. Uh, your presentation is a very original approach as it looks at the Diyarbakish Kortish as a periodical. Do you know if the Kortish actually accomplished to accompany the rhythm of sections? Adelaide. Dr. Machado. Uh, it's a bit slow. The, ah, no, it's okay now. Uh, I would like to, to thank you, Sandra, for your question. Uh, I would like to start by a preamble, now that we are in the indoors of the Diario das Cortes, to say that in that time, uh, people couldn't know what was going on in Parliament, because only a few places were for public, the rest uh, was, people couldn't see, couldn't know what was happening. So this, uh, this newspaper, I consider it a periodical because it responds to the to the need of information about what is going on on the the parliament. It is also specialized because it's only about the speeches and the propositions presented in the house of parliament. Uh, it doesn't follow the commissioners, the sections. Uh, he only follows what happens in the hemicycle, in the, in the place where the debates happen, where the proposals are made. Uh, so it, it's the importance of this, this news, he, and also is a periodical because it lasts for three, four months during the year, uh, per year. That is the time when the, the, the courts the, 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 the parliament is reunited. So um, I believe it's a, a, an important source if you want to, uh, as I, as I pointed, pointed, the colonial question, the debates, it's one of the most important uh, sources, but you need to cross it with other newspapers on th in, the, in the same period but it is quite important because they have the key groups, uh, people that write what they, as in court, uh, what the, the, the MPs say, all the proposals, and then the editors review and pass, print it for the printing. So it's, it's a, a lot of people involved, like a newspaper, a normal newspaper. Uh, the duration is three, four months per year, and I think I could uh, consider it uh, at least a journal that gives uh, information and also um, as all the, the press in this time all, and now and from the future want to, 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 to bring the truth to the, to the people, it's important because they were always available for people to go and see what they are what they said yesterday or the day before the, the last week they have their copies for everyone to to see and um, to avoid slander in the in the other in the other uh, newspaper so it's a way it's not perfect but it's a way as they said as they pointed and so and they discuss discuss with the other the other MPs how it would function. Uh, they, they made points, they want to publish everything, not only the victorious proposals. So at this period, and it changes like all the other newspapers, 
as the committee editor committees are change change so uh, it's 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 open to discussion i i, I think sandra thank you thank you uh, dr machado uh, sandra has put the link of this paper for for the research uh, there is another question uh, to dr sharmila paish uh, sandra written that your presentation is resting. How do you view the rebirth of periodicals in Goa and the starting of periodicals in Bombay in 1835 in the context of being linked with a dispute on legitimacy and the representation of liberalism in a colonial context? Yes, Dr. Pai. Yes, yes. I, I see the the rebirth of periodicals in the 19th century as, as an issue of a, a contradiction or a paradox, as if I may call it. A contradiction because the constitutional regime of the 19th century set the right tone of having a very liberal and a secular government. But unfortunately, it could not maintain that tone of liberalism uh, simply because uh, we know that the constitutional regime experienced uh, lots of ups and downs. The government alternated between liberals and the absolutists. So if the press was to be the organ of the government, it would definitely take the tone of the government. So when the government was liberal, the press served, the, the tone of the press was liberal. And when the government alternated, when it became conservative and absolutist, it, uh, it, it was but natural that it should uh, speak on the other side of the fence. This is what I have to say about uh, the view of the press. As far as Bombay was concerned, the issue of legitimacy uh, was concerned. Uh, I mean, it, this is, you know, one aspect of which I understand that was a question. Now, issue of legitimacy being concerned between Bombay and uh, uh, colonial Goa, I think both the, uh, you know, press, press, that is in uh, colonial Goa and Bombay, they were trying to legitimize their stance. In Bombay, a number of Goans were established there. And if you, uh, you know, since the 19th century, British India had uh, facilitated the settlement of Goans for, for various purpose, workforce and uh, new uh, uh, laws that were established. So the supporters of the prof, uh, of the of Bernard Parrish the Silver, they try to legitimate he's the, the stand of of the prefect or Bernard Parish the Silver trying to defend his stand of how he was right. And on the other hand, you have the press in colonial Goa, which by 1835 trying to uh, counter the press of, of Bernard. So you have counter and you have, you know, against contradicting. This is what I, I, I see it as. I don't know if I've uh, answered your questions, Sandra. I don't know if that was what you wanted me to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You can. Speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um. Yes. Yeah, so basically, you you have responded. What I find interesting in this situation between 1835 and 1837 is that you have a, a native uh, uh, government which was uh, appointed by the king. Yes. who yes and and comes uh, uh, to govern in the name of uh, a certain liberal framework and then you have a, a, a government in goa that uh, uh, appears after uh, in revolt against this uh, appointment and also uh, claims for a legitimacy uh, which is another kind of legitimacy uh, that I would say colonial. It tries to unite the, the colonial um, uh, uh, legitimacy of, uh, the, uh, with the liberal. So uh, 
the, uh, basically what I, I'm not, from what I understand, they uh, uh, claim that the Portuguese and its descendants were the right persons to uh, represent Portugal and, uh, and uh, uh, liberal uh, point, uh, point of view. And that is a very interesting uh, and original, I would say very original situation in uh, not only in Portugal uh, colonial history, but in world colonial history, I would say. And that's it. <laughs> Dr. Wright, would you like to respond? Uh, I do agree that uh, I do agree that the the European, the conservative European, uh, and the and the Luso descendants, perhaps not all of them, they, they were also exceptions to the rule. Uh, they acted as one faction, at least during that particular period, and uh, the the press, you know, brings out this issue of of one faction against the other so it is the european and the and the luso descendants trying to trying to challenge the 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 so called native i would put it in quotes the the indigenous or the the local elite so you find that kind of a a challenge each one trying to legitimize their position and that is what i i find in the press and i suppose the the a Goan elite could not operate in Goa for the simple reason that there was no private press then. So it was it was but natural that Bombay should uh, should be a ideal base for them. You know, it provided a, a perfect environment for them to to counter the attacks of the of the Portuguese and the Luso descendants. Thank you, Shamil. Uh, uh, you know, there is a, a discussion going on with regard to the dialects. And uh, uh, Dr. Narona, I'd like to ask you whether you feel there was a paradigm shift between uh, the way of thinking towards languages and dialects of, six, of 17th century when Portuguese and when uh, when Goa when Konkani was uh, was uh, kind of uh, made a second class language, as compared to the liberal period, do you feel that there was a paradigm shift in the tone and tenor of the Portuguese government towards the press? I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure I answered, answered your question, Cielo. Absolutely, Sibeli. Your subject matter is, is so lovely, so interesting. Absolutely, thank you. you. Uh, Sandra has spoken uh, a point to Frederick. Frederick has made a good point, which goes back a little to my presentation, that is of the need to address complexity in analysis of a colonial press, starting the conceptual framework we use when reading such press. Would you like to respond, Dr. Narona? Uh, it's of course it is it is uh, it's a, it's a crucial issue but also sandra raised the point of uh, the need for journalism mass media studies in goa uh, i'm seeing it as a bit wider than that in the sense that uh, we have a shortage of local studies in most in most disciplines and uh, we need to push more strongly for that but uh, sandra what exactly is your point sorry Okay, the conceptual framework. Okay, fine. Uh, it was mostly a more uh, a comment uh, on the. Uh, it has a lot of to do with the location when you from where you you write you think history and write history, and many times when you depart from a certain locations, say like Portugal or Goa. Uh, it influences the way you look at, the, at your object, and you tend not to address uh, complexity and different points of view uh, and different issues when 
when, when approaching documents. documents. It's, it's so much, much more, more common, common than and I think, I think it's a, a, uh, also, also something, something for all, all of us to reflect about when, uh, when, so, uh, when, when studying and, and uh, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, approaching, approaching documents. documents. Sandra, actually, if I could add, you know, I think we are living under this huge shadow of uh, Anglo-centric uh, studies. So, so all our understanding of of South Asia is basically based on this huge uh, Anglophone literature that that is so dominant before forty seven and continues to be dominant after forty seven in that sense. So, uh, you know, for instance, I think uh, I was surprised when I read uh, Martin Martin Page's book. It's it's more of a journalistic book. It's not so scholarly. Uh, he talks about uh, Portugal, the 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 empire that created a global village or something of that sort. And in that in that book, he also argues that uh, when you when you read when you read a British uh, author writing about Portugal, please take it with a handful of salt. So it's ironical because he himself is British, and uh, he himself is critical of the same tradition. Uh, there is another scholar called Martin uh, von Tangent Page, von Tangent Page, who is actually looking at the Goa British uh, equation, and he's planning to come out with a work called uh, Marriage of Inconvenience, which I thought the title was very, uh, very, very catchy, because uh, it looks at uh, you know the kind of Goa British series of misunderstandings that that we've had, uh, even the colonial powers have had, maybe the Portuguese and the British have had over over centuries in that sense they are allies at one level and at a le another level they are also competitors and they've got this rivalry between northern europe and southern europe and all that so yeah, yeah. yes i, I, I just leave, uh, uh, going to your point i just leave a, a last comment we ourselves as uh, scholars are uh, nowadays very much pressured by the hegemony of uh, Anglo Saxon uh, uh, scholarship and the conceptual framework uh, and the, the kind of uh, hegemonic discourse that they produce uh, 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 around various matters, uh, 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 namely. Uh, 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 when addressing the colonial question. So, um, what, what we can do is, uh, is so, uh, so uh, to, to invest, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in general, uh, 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 a framework, a conceptual framework. That, that takes into, into account, account uh, the, uh, the realities which uh, we are dealing, dealing with and uh, uh, put, uh, try to discuss it in, in uh, 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 a light or larger academic environments. It is very difficult, and it's not easy, and uh, um, but it, I, I think it's worth uh, that we, we uh, persist on that part. Uh, I, would I would like, like to ask uh, Dr. Lerona, when, when you talk, talk about paradoxes of the colonial dress, uh, for example, a issue of language or dialect, dialect. I, find I find that, that the, the last 10 or 15 years before 1961, the, the local press, which was uh, talking, talking about, about these uh, aspects was, was totally, totally opposite to the, the colonial press, which, which was basically in Portuguese, Portuguese language. language. Would, Would you agree, agree with me? me? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm not denying that, you know, each language doesn't have its own class and caste connotations. And although we though that is less relevant now, uh, I'm not denying that for a moment. It's a reality and we have to face up to it. But on the other hand, Every language has not accepted that Goa is multilingual, you know, or multi-scriptural or multi-dialectical uh, in that sense, almost. So the conversation is not happening. There, there are vast differences between all the all the different languages, no doubt. Uh, Marathi is also equally understudied. And yesterday, someone, I think Sandra, Dr. Sandra raised the point that 
all these uh, issues may be of Go and Tribune. If you want to find them at one place, where do we find them? You know, or issues of any 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 uh, particular periodical. That that is another challenge there. So tomorrow it will be ac difficult to access also. But I agree with your point. Uh, as, as we come, come are there any more questions? questions? Uh, I consider uh, that the question and answer session is closed and, and I'd like to speak for a Yes, there is a question for Sibeli uh, from uh, CLO, Dr. CLO, uh, Sibeli. Uh, it is in the chat box. She says, I understand that the study of the Quraysh is of great importance for the history of Goa. How does it relate to the study of the colonial press? I mean, to the colonial press, what aspect of colonial history does it show that we do not see? Thank you, Sushila. Thank you, Cielo, for the question. Actually, the four eyes are a much earlier uh, source of 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 many many information lot of lots of information um, on actually land use but uh, as they were made um, during the 16th and 17th centuries they contain like how can you we say um, they contain an original very uh, especially the earliest the the earlier ones like the foral de salsete um the foral de, de ilhas and the foral de, de bardes the the first ones to be written they have like um how you say a, they have almost a textual stratigraphy that you can um you can look at and find exactly how this all this landscape was before um before the persecution and before the destruction of the sacred landscape that was in goa so i think they are fundamental and i have studied them through some aspects of them because you can do the opposite uh work you can through what is there, you can reconstruct this landscape. So I think they are fundamental. And the colonial press only, uh, we, we have information on temples only from the 19th century onwards. So they are, uh, the Forais are certainly something that must be looked at by many, many scholars, uh, especially the Foral de Salsete, who was, um, was not available due to the problems on conservation and it was restored so now it's available for for research since 1916 and uh, it's it's a very interesting um, document i'm not sure i answered your question cielo Absolutely, Sibeli. Your subject matter is, is so lovely, so interesting. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandra has spoken uh, her point to Frederick. Frederick has made a good point, which goes back a little to my presentation, that is of the need to address complexity in analysis of colonial press, starting the conceptual framework we use when reading such press. Would you like to respond, Dr. Narona? Uh, it 
was mostly a more uh, a comment uh, on the. Uh, it ha it has a lot of to do with the, the location when you from where you you write you think history and write history, and many times when you depart from a certain location, say Portugal or Goa. Uh, it influences the way you look at the at your object, and you tend not to address uh, complexity and different points of view uh, and different issues when uh, when approaching documents. It was more a comment, and I think it's a, uh, also something for uh, all of us to reflect about when. Uh, when uh, when studying and uh, when uh, when uh, approaching documents Yes, I, I, I just leave, uh, uh, going to your point, I just leave a, a last comment. We ourselves as uh, scholars are, are uh, nowadays very much pressured by the hegemony of uh, anglo saxophone uh, Saxon uh, uh, scholarship and the conceptual framework uh, and the, the kind of uh, uh, hegemonic dis discourses they produce uh, 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 around various matches, uh, uh, namely uh, 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 when addressing uh, the colonial questions. So um, what we can do is, uh, is so, uh, uh, to invest uh, in uh, in uh, in developing uh, 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 a, a, a framework, a conceptual framework that has into account uh, the uh, the realities which uh, we are dealing with and. Uh, uh, put uh, try to discuss it in in a uh, uh, large or larger academic environments. It is very difficult. It's not easy, and uh, um, but it's, I, I think it's worth uh, uh, that we we uh, persist on that path. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Larona. When you talk about paradoxes of the colonial press, uh, for example, an uh, issue of language or dialect, I find that the last 10 or 15 years before 1961, the local press, which was uh, talking about these uh, aspects, was totally opposite to the colonial press which was 
basically in Portuguese, Portuguese language. Would you agree with me? Uh, as we come, are there any more questions? Uh, I consider uh, that the question answer session is closed. And I'd like to speak for a minute uh, as a part of our gratitude for whatever has happened in the past two days. As we end our two day webinar, I thank all the speakers. I thank uh, Professor Rosa Maria Ferres, Dr. Sandra Ataib Lobo, Dr. Cielo Griselda Pestino, Dr. Adelaide Vieira Machado, Dr. Sharmila Paish, Dr. Frederick Narona, and Dr. Sibeli Aldrowandi. I also take this opportunity to say a big thank you to Dr. Sandra Ataib Lobo for laying the seed that has seen its fructification in the past two days. I thank our collaborators, the Center for Humanities and the Center for Research in Anthropology and Circle of Studies in South Asia, all in Portugal, along with the group of the periodical press. I also thank my collaborators in Goa, my co-partners, Dr. Sharmila Paish, and Dr. Frederick Narona. Uh, international webinar of this magnitude involves a lot of nitty gritties, which both of them have patiently borne. I also thank all the participants and listeners in Goa, Portugal, Brazil, and uh, in Konkani, we always say, Mog Asundi and Dev Borekorun, or thank you. But uh, being the woman that I am, I keep the last word for the gentleman. Dr. Norona, would you like to say something? You caught me unawares on two counts because I was not prepared and it's normally ladies. Okay. Uh, but, but just thanks to everyone for coming here. It's so nice to have you all. Uh, we hope that we can have uh, more such events. I want to say thanks to the pandemic also because it's made us realize that uh, you don't have to be physically close to be close in ideas and and you know physical distances distancing is important but not social distancing looking forward to more events more suggestions more collaborations as sandra was saying we need a different worldview so since our languages are not improving we hope that google translate will make it easier for us and we can only hope that that will be the way out but I'm just joking. Thank you so much for everyone who has come here. And, you know, so many people have stayed on till the very end. Please, uh, let's look at more, more topics, more suggestions that we can work on this front. Thank you. Uh, to tie the ribbons, if Dr. Sharmila Paish would like to say a sentence or two, please do. Yeah, I think uh, enough has been said, Dr. Sushila, very appropriately by you and Frederick. Thank you once again to all and have a pleasant day or evening ahead. Thank you, everybody. We now declare the webinar as closed. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.